Yeah. You know you want to try it, so we might as well do it on the count of three. Word up. Ready? One, two, three. Yeah, yeah just like that, right? Brand new series all about the B-I-B-L-E. Some of you grew up around a song similar. Not quite similar, right? Uh, you got to City Line, and City Line, as we do, we take it up a notch, right? We take it up to the next level. You either get Austin going ham on the guitar behind the back, right? Austin Lemons, right? Or, or you just get the Bible jam. You know what I'm saying? And whatever it is, we combine both on the same weekend and call it church. So welcome to City Line, right? We're glad that you are here. It's an incredible weekend. And like we said, we're in a brand new series uh, that we're calling Word Up that's really all about helping build a better relationship with the Bible because there's so many people in the room that probably have a certain perception or understanding of what the Bible is or isn't. That, that, that maybe you've got some connotations about the Bible that would just lead you to believe that it's just hard or it's difficult or, or maybe some of you, you, were, you never engaged in scripture and you've always felt kind of distant from the whole thing and you're just not sure what to make of it. Maybe it's old and antiquated and, and you just don't think that it's, it's good for you or for your life, but it's nice for other people. And then there's others that, that just find it controversial. There's others that might even read some things that they would find somewhat offensive in scripture and they're not sure what to make of it or how that's supposed to work or what that's supposed to look like. And so what we said is we want to do is we want to, we want to talk about it. We, we want to engage scripture a little bit more because regardless of your perception of scripture, the reality is that this, this, these historical documents, these written words have the ability to impact our life in an incredible way. In fact, last week we said it this way. The author of Hebrews says that the word of God, in reference to the scriptures, understanding the word of God is alive and it's active. That, that these are not just more pages, on, uh, you know, just words on a page. This is not just another book that you just add to your library shelves. This is not just a book that you leave on your coffee table, and when things get hard, you, you know, brush it back off, get to that favorite scripture that you've highlighted or underlined several times. The reality is, he says, the word of God is alive and it's active. And then he took it up a notch and says it's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and Tomorrow, and then this is where it really gets to the heart of what's going on. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. These things that we think, the stuff that we think we know about, the, 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 the way that we want to live our life, that, that stuff that's going on inside our heart, whether our hearts have warmed up to God and who he is, or whether our hearts remain cold and distant to God, the reality is, is the word can change and affect and impact whoever's heart is in the room, whoever's heart is willing to actually engage this scripture. In fact, we understood that the Bible is the best-selling book, not just of last year, but of every year and of all time, that nine hours out of 10 households actually own a Bible. In fact, most households would own an average of four. I mean, four, four of the word of God, four of these scriptures stuffed away somewhere, sitting on the coffee table, held up on a plaque or, or, or pasted across the back room windows. I, I, whatever you do with your scriptures, you have it available to you. So availability isn't the problem. Accessibility isn't the problem. The reality is for you and I, statistics, studies show that whether you are religious or whether you consider yourself non-religious, the reality is, is disengagement with scriptures is at an all-time high. We continually disengage with scriptures for, for whatever reason. I'm sure that many of us have lots of reasons why we do, yet we understood last week that, that really that one of the single best ways to encounter God is through his word. One of the single best ways to actually encounter God is through, is through the, the scriptures. So, so I want to kind of talk about what that looks like. This series is going to help us build a better relationship with Scripture. And to do that, I don't know, I had fun with food last week, so I thought I'd do it again this week. You know what I'm saying? Just because it's fun to do that, right? Like, here's the reality. They, they tell me, they tell me, I've heard this before, maybe you have too, that breakfast is the most important meal of the day, right? Like, you don't, you just don't skip breakfast because breakfast is so important. But, but have you ever thought about all the stuff that we eat for breakfast? See, I, I, think, I think cereal, cereal is an all time like just it's just a breakfast hit forever I mean it's so simple and easy all you got to do is add milk boom there you go you're ready to go right everything in there is for you but have you ever read like some of the stuff that you eat right like it's this is this is honey nut checks it's it's gluten free and it's got no high fructose corn syrup it's got no artificial flavors colors or preservatives it says that it is naturally flavored it's got whole grain I mean it's it's the first ingredient we just started with whole grain. 
okay, so you started with whole grain and it's actually made with real honey. I guess my question to you, for those of you that love some checks, right? Like, how do you know? How do you know that any of that is true? How do you know that, that that wheat was the actual first ingredient? How do you know that that maybe it wasn't like the grease or the oil that they put actually in the container that holds the wheat that is actually the first one? And they just forgot. Like the reality is, is sometimes, here's what I'm saying, we don't know, but we love our breakfast cereal. We like the healthy stuff, and we like stuff that would consider itself to be healthy, right? <laughs> like, like Honey Nut Cheerios would consider itself to be healthy. And, and, and most of us, with same idea. We love the fact that it's, it's whole grain. They too apparently agree that it's the very first ingredient that we start with. You know what I mean? Just so you know, it's the first ingredient. But then they pack it in with all kinds of other details that make us excited about the cereal and the ease in which we can make this delicious treat because it it can help lower your cholesterol. Did you know that? That Cheerios is trying to help you get healthy, right? Cheerios is, 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 is concerned about your heart. When the CEO of Cheerios sits in his office, he's thinking about your heart pumping in your chest, right? I mean, just think about that. And then again, at the same time, when you read the ingredients, you've got whole grain, our number one ingredient, followed by sugar, Sugar and cornstarch and honey and brown triptasium phosphate <laughs> and whatever that is. But, but, but here, here, here's the thing. How do, how do we know? How, 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 do you, how, do you actually, how do you actually know that that's, that's really what, at the end of the day you're putting in your body? Oh, yeah, it, it does get better because, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, magically delicious. You know what I'm saying? Like. I mean, when you say it's magically delicious, you're just like, I just want to know if it's true, right? You know what I mean? Like, I just got to know. And it's not just magically delicious. I mean, again, you're talking about gluten-free magically delicious, right? You're, you're talking about, you know, it's only 110 calories and only 170 grams of sodium. And can you believe this? You would only be willing to pump your body with 10 sugars in the morning. Right? Just 10. And then they also have a promotion right now that you can fill out an application or fill out something and drop it in and get your chance to win just a free box of marshmallows. <laughs> Did you know that? In case there's not enough marshmallows in your lucky charms, right? Okay, but, but it's lucky, right? <laughs> right? Word up, right? Like we need that, right? Word up, right? We love us some lucky charms. I, growing up, I, I, we had lucky charms in the house. It felt like all the time. And I think it wasn't because me and my brother, my dad loved some lucky charms, right? Like he, he would eat lucky charms like no. And and then there's those that like, okay, if you just hate breakfast, right? Like if if, if you just want to, you know, if you want to step off the fun bus, you know what I'm saying? Then then you you would just, you would just do oats, right? Because oats just is plain enough, right? Like guess what you get, like you get in all these others, there's, they're whole grains. You know what I'm saying? You get, you get, it's their first ingredient and, and they too apparently are heart healthy and they too apparently are all natural and they apparently, you know, they're 150 calories, which, which actually is more than your Lucky Charms. But you know what? It, it's, it's just, it's only point gram of, of fat that you would consume in, in your early morning uh, food decisions. Where am I going with this? Oh, it gets better. I mean, the reality is, is that this cool thing, that it's, called, it's called the protein cookie, right? One of my favorite cookies. This touts is 16 grams of protein. You know what I'm saying? It's all natural. I mean, you got no dairy, no egg, no soy, no GMO. I mean, it's completely vegan. And just for good measure, we threw in 10 grams of fiber, right? Because everybody knows that if you're eating cardboard, you're going to need some fiber, right? Like that's just the reality, okay? You know that to be true. Okay, so that one we might understand to be true. That one might have some significance. But here's the deal. We've probably eaten one of these or more at any given time. And the reality is, is we truly don't know that if what they tell us on the box, the triglyceride, phosphate, magnesium, potentially, and, and, and red, yellow, and blue droplet things that they put in it. Like we just, we don't know one, what those really are. And two, we don't know if they're actually in there. And three, have you ever stopped to count and and see if there is really 16 grams of protein? No, many of us just take it for what it is. Many of us just kind of go with it. Many of us are not concerned about the, the ingredients labels on the back. We're just concerned if it tastes good, if it's quick, if we can get it now, because we got to get out the door because you can't be late for work. See, sometimes the reality is, is we do the same thing when it comes to Bible engagement. 
See, see, see one, one, one of the biggest things that creates so much stir and so much controversy and in so many ways it is this thing that's known of as the Bible, as, as Scripture. And the reality behind that is for hundreds of years, the Bible has been fair game and an open topic of debate about what's in it and what should be in it and what's not in it and how come this is in it and that's not in it. And these things just seem to kind of, you know, I don't know, just, just kind of, they don't go together. And so what, what do we make of this? In other words, today I want to talk about something significant when it comes to the Bible. Because although we have opinions of the Bible, although we, 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 some of us push it away and some of us, you know, we, we embrace it, the reality is, 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 are we just supposed to accept it, just blind faith like we do in our breakfast cereal in the morning? Or is there more to it than that? In other words, like, how, how do I actually know, how do I actually know that, that what I'm reading, that, 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 that if this is the best way to encounter God, that this is vital to discovering and following Jesus, well, how do I even know that, that this word of God that I hold in my hand, how do I know that it's reliable? How, how do I even know that it's even reliable? Because you probably heard all the arguments. Like we said, it's outdated and antiquated, and nobody lives like that, so that doesn't apply to my life. Or there's only certain things you're supposed to apply to your life, and there's certain things that are irrelevant to your life. Or, or you know, there's just too many errors, too many historical inaccuracies, too many contradictions in the Bible. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, it's just, it's legend. It's fairy tale. You know, like people just kind of made it up. They just, it's, it's, a, it's one big fable, just kind of just a, a support for those who kind of just need a crutch, you know, to get through life for, for, for being so weak. Like we've heard all the arguments. Chances are, if you've been around church long enough, if you've been outside of the church long enough, if you've talked to your friends about Jesus, if you've tried to invite people to church, you've probably heard all those things at one time or another. And my guess is for some of us in the room, at one time, we would say that we had a strong connection with Scripture because we grew up just being taught Scripture and we believed everything in Scripture. And then one day in school, we got to, to some part and somebody challenged our faith. And because we didn't investigate it for ourselves, because we didn't know exactly what was in it, they said enough that it shook our faith. And instead of going back to scriptures now and investigating again for ourselves, we just took it at face value and we just disconnected from the scriptures altogether. Well, what if we could reconnect and actually build an entirely better relationship? What if we could learn uh, about the Bible's reliability? What if we could be able to trust in the claims that the Bible has? What am I saying when I'm saying reliability? If you're following along your notes, I hope this is helpful to you. I I understand that some people, you you won't take notes and and, and I'm just, I just wanna encourage you. I really think you should. You know, because it's one thing to come and sit in a seat and just hear and sit and listen. But the reality is, is sometimes you're not going to absorb everything just by osmosis, right? Like it's just not just going to automatically happen, right? You're just not going to just, it's going to just one ear and out the other sometimes. I get it. And if you're here and you're skeptical, I really think that you should take notes, especially during this series, because it should at very least have you ask some more questions. Have you investigate further about some of the claims of Scripture? Reliability, when it comes to the Bible, is just the quality of being trustworthy. Biblically speaking, it's whether or not what the Bible contains from ideas to history to geography is trustworthy or not. These things that we read in here, is that trustworthy? How do I know that this is actually trustworthy? How do I know that I can, I can place my faith in the scriptures? And is it just like the opinions of a bunch of people? I mean, last week you said it's written by 40 different authors over a period of over 1,500 years. I mean, so, so it's just, is it just their opinion? How do I know? And what I want you to understand is there's numerous ways that we can approach this question. For today, we're just going to primarily focus on a historical approach. I'm just going to ask you to kind of Bible nerd out with me for a little bit, okay, as we're going to walk through this, okay? I think it's it's important for your faith, so I'm going to ask you to kind of hang in there and and kind of follow along with with what I'm saying. Because over time, the Bible has been subjected to vigorous, I'm talking vigorous, both literary and historical criticism, probably more than any other ancient work ever. And here's what we find time and time again. This is not just biblical scholars' understanding. This is just scholars in general. Historical scholars would agree that held up to historical scrutiny, the Bible remains the most trusted, historically accurate work of ancient literature ever documented. And I know that's a big statement, and I'm glad you think it's a big statement. And you're like, I sure hope you have some, something to support that statement. Because, I mean, that's, that's, that's big. And you're saying if it's not just Bible scholars, but, but that it's just scholars in general, those, those who are historians and those who have investigated and those who have asked questions of it, then, then, then we need to know more. And I would agree, we need to lean into more because this is a big statement. And I want us to, to start off with, with, what, with the view of, of what the early church, the, those that were following Jesus, I want you to, to kind of start there. What's so fascinating to me, it was when guys like Paul would write scripture to the church, right? He didn't know he was writing scriptures to the church. 
Paul was writing letters to encourage people about the good news that they had heard, right? He was, he was writing letters to remind them about God and who he was. In an age of confusion, in an age when so much was going on, so much controversy, Paul would write letters to the church reminding them of who they were. In this particular passage, he writes to a young pastor named Timothy. And Timothy is kind of taking a lead role within this, this church. Paul is actually writing Timothy from prison, and Paul is facing imminent death as he sits in prison. He knows that his time has come and it's time to kind of pass the torch, so to speak, right? To encourage young Timothy to continue to move on and to not forget what he understood and learned. And what's so fascinating is when Paul would write these letters and and, and their carriers would bring the letters to the person, they would get the community of faith around and you know what they would do? They'd read them aloud, right? They would read them out loud. So I just thought it'd be fun to try that today. I know, I know. I'm going to invite you to do it. Some of you will, some of you won't. It's okay. You know what I'm saying? But those that will, would you join me in this? In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. This is, this is what Paul reminds Timothy. He says this, ready? All scriptures is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. He goes on. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, I don't know about you, but just hearing that out loud, like just hearing the community of faith, those that are trying to lean into a relationship with God, I mean, the reality, I mean that, that, that carried a lot of power right there, even if we don't fully understand it. Can you imagine them, them reading this passage, you know, or, or reading these thoughts, you know, that Paul wrote to the community at large and everybody sitting there and you can feel the power and the passion of it. But at the same time, you're like, but I don't get it. <laughs> like, 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 what, like what exactly does that mean? What would you, would you explain? And I love that Paul makes this statement in Scripture. He says, he says all Scripture is God-breathed. That, 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 like we talked about last week, it's, it's inspired by God. It's not dictated by God. It's written by man, but it's inspired by God. And he says, this God-breathed, inspired word of God, although written by many, it's the source of God's words to you and I. It's more than just a roadmap that helps you arrive at the treasure at the end of the map. He said, it's not even really that roadmap at all. Actually, this is something that impacts your life right here, right now, as you actively engage it, as you actually begin to read it. To which you say, well, Jack, that just sounds like like he's just making a blanket statement. It sounds more like his opinion. And and you know, we can't base reliability and trustworthiness just based on opinion alone, right? Like, I mean, nobody would ever do that. So how do we really know? And I think it's this, that the trustworthiness of any historical account is judged on the the basis of evidence and not proof. It's evidence and not proof. We're looking for evidence. Can we open up our Lucky Charms box and find the evidence of marshmallows, right? Only if you have a certain picture of what a marshmallow looks like, right? Like, because when I open them up and I look at their marshmallows, I'm like, that's not the marshmallow I'm used to, right? You know, it's just different. It's like a freeze-dried marshmallow, if that's even possible, right? But the reality is, is we can open it up and we can probably find evidence, and that evidence would give us a clear understanding, okay, there, there's marshmallows in there. So the reality is it's not proof. This is where we begin to ask questions of the text. This is where we begin to engage Scripture and we begin to ask questions, to which some of you, you grew up in church and you're always told, don't ask questions. Just take it. Just listen to the person talking up there, know that it's true, and walk out of here and with a smile on your face, right? Like, I mean, that's the reality, right? Just don't question it. Here's what I'm saying. Like, faith invites us to question. God gave us a mind, and if God would give us a mind, then he requires us to use reason, right? So that we can actually investigate for ourselves, that we can feel this. It's an experience. That's why we say God wants to be personal, God wants to be personal because he, he wants to connect, he wants to, us to encounter him through his word so that we can actually investigate it. And here's what I just want to suggest. Sometimes the people with the most, with the most faith are the ones that are willing to ask the most questions. <laughs> I'm just going to say it, okay? I'm just going to, that, that one's free because it's Father's Day, okay? You know, it's like, you can take that one, right? A little golden nugget for you right there, okay? okay? But, but, but when we're talking about history, okay, and we're looking at the things that happen in, in history, and, and we're trying to make sense of those things, it, it's hard to prove or disprove events that happen in history. It's hard to kind of disprove those things because they they happen in the past. So in other words, in investigating history, it's not a matter of proving something. We want to try to make sense of something that happened in the past. So you have to look for the evidence. In other words, if you're approaching this from a scientific way, science would say that only what you can only prove what is observable and repeatable. 
okay? You can repeat past mistakes, I'm sure. But to go back and talk about like this Middle Eastern culture where Jesus lived, can, can we actually observe that? Can we actually repeat that? Probably not. We need to look for evidence of that. What evidence exists? And there are four ways that we can do that when it comes to testing Scripture. In fact, I would love for us to look at the ways that we can test Scripture, that we can ask questions of the text because I think it's going to help us kind of ease some of our concerns and kind of ease some of our thoughts. Some of you, some of the things I'm going to say today, you might have heard this at one time or another. What I want to do is I want to look at the argument, but I also want us to just look back at Scripture. I want us to look at what we've heard about Scripture and some of the pushback that people have had, but I also just want us to kind of lean in to to some some fact and some truth that we discover as well, okay? Because this is helpful. When when we're testing for evidence, there's there's several ways you can do it. We're going to look at four ways today, and the first is this. It's the bibliographic test. The bibliographic test, okay? In other words, it's the manuscripts. It's the manuscripts. I don't know if you realize this or not. The Bible is an ancient manuscript like we talked about last week. And all of ancient history, even outside of the Bible, everything you know about Caesar, everything you know about Rome, everything you know about Nero, everything you know about historical figures, we know about them. All that stuff you were forced to learn in your high school history class, right? We know about that because it comes from ancient manuscripts. People took time to actually write things down. It was their role. It, it, was, it was their job. And what the, the bibliographic test does is it actually takes a look at these manuscripts that, of the Bible and it asks whether or not the text of the Bible today is actually close to or, or, or the same as the original. The same as the original. To which the, the argument goes, well, well, when it comes to the documents that make up the Bible, we don't actually have original manuscripts. So isn't it true without the original, the very first copy, the original manuscripts, can we still trust the Bible? The reality is, is we don't have those original transcripts because of a lot of the persecution that the church experienced, a lot of the, the burning at the hands of the Roman government and destroying of things. But the reality is, is that shouldn't stop us from leaning in. Because let's be honest, how do you know if the man, manuscript that you have on any given date is trustworthy or not? I think there's two ways you can find out. First, you look for date and distribution. You look for date and distribution of the manuscript. When was it written and how many copies do you have circulated? So you might not have the original, but when was the original written? Okay, roughly estimated, right? When when is your earliest copy? And then how many times was it actually reproduced after that? The second way you can do that is you find out all you can about the people who actually wrote the manuscripts. You find out all the evidence, all the stuff that you can possibly dig up about the people who actually wrote these things, who actually took time to sit down and walk through these things. You you know, it's fascinating that you and I, we're more familiar with manuscripts than what we might think. Okay, we're more familiar with manuscripts than what we, what we might think. In, in, in your history classes or maybe even in your, your college, you know, kind of uh, general ed work, or maybe some of you were history majors, most of us were, it's not uncommon to be asked to read things like Homer's Iliad, right? To, to kind of have some background on that or, or Julius Caesar's Gaelic Wars, right? And here's the reality behind those things. Those are historical accounts. In fact, Homer's Iliad is the most famous book of ancient Greece, and nobody ever denies its authenticity because we have over 640 ancient copies. The oldest, the oldest manuscript was copied, get this, 2,200 years after the original. That's, pretty, that's, that's a long time, right? I mean, it, wouldn't you agree that's a long time to maybe fabricate some things, to maybe make up some stuff, to maybe forgot some details, right? I mean, that's a long time after the fact, right? L- let, me, let me help you with this. I know it's hard to see, and I'm not asking you to memorize this or take a picture of it, but I just thought it'd be cool because those things are on here. Here's Caesar and the Gaelic Wars. It was written for, uh, uh, 100 to, to 44 BC. The earliest copy that was uh, discovered was 900 AD, right? Which means it was written a hundred, uh, or excuse me, a thousand years after the fact. That's the earliest. A thousand years after the actual event is when it actually happened. And the number of copies that we have, 10. 10. And nobody denies that those things happened. Nobody denies what Caesar said. And then you have Homer right here. You got Homer, 900 BC, okay? The earliest copy, 400 BC, Okay, this is actually giving you a newer account than what I just read, 500 years, even 500 years. I mean, would you agree that 500 years is is a a long time to get stuff lost in translation? Yet, yet there is 643 copies. 
643 copies of Homer's Iliad. Yet, when it comes just to the New Testament alone, right, it was written from 40 to 100 A.D., right? The earliest copy was actually found in 125 A.D., right? That's roughly 25 years after the events that talk about Jesus' life. 25 years. And let me just ask a quick question. You don't have to raise your hand. Do you remember anything that happened 25 years ago? Probably if I played a certain song, if I, if, I, if I let you smell something, if I, you know, if I, if I took you to a certain place, you, you would know. Those of you that have been out of high school for 25 years, you remember like it was yesterday. Don't lie, right? <laughs> like some of you fathers in the room, you've been talking about it for 25 years. Like you know, you, that story keeps getting bigger and better every time, right? Like more heroic acts of dad greatness. You know what I mean? It's like awesome, right? But here's the reality, right? 25 years after, and how much, how, how, how many were actually distributed? How many copies do we actually have? Over 24,000 just, just for the New Testament. What am I saying? For the Bible, there is presently over 5,000 Greek manuscripts just for the Bible, the, the, the Bible in its entirety. For the New Testament, there are more than 24,000. You're just like, yeah, you are Bible nerding out today because that, that, that's, that's some, some detail that I would never thought to ask. Right, right, because sometimes we just take things for face value. Sometimes it's just our lucky charm faith, right? Like, like sometimes it's just our cheerio faith, right? Like we just, we just want to add water and boom, we just want to go out the door, right? We want to get that little passage of scripture and we just want to be like, whoa, I got enough to get through the day. Here's the reality though. You're a part and you have something at your fingertips that is so much greater than you actually understand and know that has power, that, 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 that has a presence about it, that it's actually alive and, and active. See, the reality is, is, is there's, there's all these translations that back it up. In fact, the current surviving biblical manuscripts get closer to the original work than any other manuscripts in the ancient world. That the Bible, when it comes to the Bible, it, it, the, the surviving ancient copies outnumber all the other ancient works. There is no other ancient document that we have that has been copied more times that we have more manuscripts for than the Bible itself. Now, just think about that. Paul, guys like Paul that we read in church, it, it, scholars believe that he wrote somewhere between 15 to 25 years after the events of Jesus Christ. Luke, Luke, the one who investigated everything and talked to key eyewitnesses, the reality is, is he wrote somewhere between 30 to 40 years after the key events that happened in Jesus's life. That's not a lot of time to make mistakes. And we're going to learn that there's another reason that that's so powerful today too, because it's not just the bibli bibliographical test, but here's another test. It's the internal test. In other words, there's these eyewitnesses. Like, did anybody see what happened? Right? Did anybody see that I actually ate two protein cookies instead of one? Right? Did anybody actually see what happens? Right? Like, you know, when, you know, those of you that are in law enforcement, we have, we have law enforcement family in the house. The reality is, is you know that we need evidence. Did, are, are there any eyewitnesses? Can you describe their features? Do you know what they look like? What color was the car? Do you have a license plate number? There's all these things you want to know if there are eyewitnesses that can tell you anything about what was going on. Why? Because they were there. When you are looking into history, historical documentation to find evidence, you want early and you want eyewitnesses because eyewitness testimony is always considered the best evidence. I mean, think about this, people who actually saw it. But the argument that most people would say when it comes to Scripture is simply this. Many people would say that the Bible is not entirely trustworthy because some parts or maybe most parts, they just were made up. It was like a myth. It was like a legend. It's like, it's like, you know, like Aesop's fables. You know what I mean? It's like, we just kind of, you know, it, it, was, it was people that they couldn't let the Jesus thing go. You know what I mean? They were fighting for a cause and they just kept kind of preaching this thing and they all kind of collaborated and cooperated to, uh, together. They just kind of keep this story going so that, so that this, this whole idea about Jesus would just, would not die. I mean, I, let's be honest. Those are all very interesting thoughts. Those are all very fascinating thoughts, but the reality is, is that the ability for a witness to actually tell the truth rests upon the witness's chronological and geographical nearness to the events. I mean, that's the reality of it. You actually had to be there. It's not something that you would know enough of just to kind of keep a story going on thousands now, thousands of years after the fact, unless the information that you were getting was actually coming from the people that were actually there. You know what I love about the Bible is when you read the historical accounts of Scripture, when you read about these sometimes even larger-than-life stories, what I love is that Moses was there. 
Moses was there in the desert, right? Like there was this burning bush experience that he had, that he talked, that he was there, he experienced that for himself. Moses was there. Can you imagine? You can, when you're reading it, you can feel his heart pounding in his chest when, when, when God told him, you're going to go to Pharaoh. He's like, I can't go to Pharaoh. That's crazy talk. You know what I'm saying? I can't do that. You can feel and you can sense. Why? Because he's writing about an experience. Joshua was there when the walls of Jericho came down. Right? These people were there. Isaiah and Jeremiah, when they lived, they observed the people. They saw what was going on. They documented the way the world was. Solomon and David, they were kings, right? They were there. They documented the things that they saw. They understood what God was doing among them. Same for guys like John and Peter and James and Matthew and Mark. And here's what I love about Peter's writing, 2 Peter 1.16. He says, for we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power. He's like, I know your argument. <laughs> I know you're saying like, right, whatever, like that's, you know, I'm... You expect me to believe that? Like all of it? Like, come on. He says, look, we didn't come up with some clever story. The reality is, is we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We actually experienced Jesus for ourselves in the flesh. We, 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 we were with him. We heard him. We walked with him. He talked to us. Luke, his investigation of key eyewitnesses. He starts out his whole account in Luke chapter 1. I have carefully investigated, right, everyone who is still alive, who could tell me about this Jesus, tell me about his death, burial, and resurrection. I, I, I did that so that I could have clarity and that you and I could have certainty to the events that took place. Paul, when he was writing, Paul was crazy enough to say that not only did Jesus die and he was raised to life, but Jesus actually appeared. People actually saw the risen Jesus, and it wasn't just his 12 favorite guys, right, or the 12 buddies that kind of hung out that we know a lot about in Scripture. He says, no, he actually appeared to over 5,000 at one time. 5,000 at one time. Uh, that, that's crazy. I mean, this is so significant because here's what's fascinating about that. That would mean that the New Testament writings were actually written and circulated within the lifetimes of hundreds of people who were alive when Jesus lived. So if they were fabricating, making stuff up, if Jesus hadn't really, you know, turned water into wine, if Jesus hadn't really died and was buried and was res resurrected to new life, anybody, hundreds of people could have stepped out and be like, wrong wrong. I'm calling you out right now. I'm saying liar, right? I'm saying fake news, <laughs> right? I'm calling you out right now. The reality is, is that never happens. That ne every opportunity has been there. That never happens. Yet this is, is one of the most hotly debated books of all time to which we think like, well, well where, where exactly are you going with this? And you're talking a lot about the New Testament, but like we'd like to know about, about the craziness of the Old Testament and like what's going on in there. And, and, and here's, here's, here's the reality. If you and I, if we believe in Jesus Christ, which nobody discounts that, 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 that Jesus lived, Jesus, he lived, right? Even, even historical figures, other historical figures outside of scholarly biblical research have documented the life of Jesus. Jewish historian Josephus, I mean, there's, I mean, you can go on. There's, there's people that know that Jesus actually lives, so nobody denies that part. So if we don't deny that Jesus lived, and Jesus did what he said he could do based on the eyewitness accounts, then the reality is, is if, if all that we believe and know about Jesus is true, then there is enough historical evidence that gives the Old Testament credibility as well, because Jesus tells us something fascinating about the scriptures. He says in Luke 24, 27, to some disgruntled Jesus followers that were frustrated that Jesus died on a cross and he was buried and they thought it was at the end. They were walking back home. They're on the road to Emmaus and Jesus shows up and says, where you guys going? They're like, well, we thought this Jesus, he was gonna, he was gonna die and be raised a new life, and I, I guess that's not gonna happen. And Jesus is like, hello, it's me, <laughs> right? They recognize Jesus in their presence, and then he says, Jesus speaking, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in what? All the scriptures. He explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning what? What? Yeah, Jesus says, hey. Everything you read about, I know it's hard to understand. It's weird. You know, you got sacrificial lamb. You got this happening. You got all this going. I mean, what, what is it? He's saying that what you need to know, it was all a foreshadowing of me. 
It was God's story about God rescuing people, about God pursuing people, wanting to redeem people, about what God was going to do through me, that now I have become the lamb who was slain, the spotless lamb who took away the sin of the world once and for all. All the scriptures point to me and who I am and what God has done for you, your redemption, your restoration, your, 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 your salvation because of his, his grace. So if we, if we can get our arms around Jesus and understand who Jesus was, then it gives better credibility to the, to the scriptures as a whole because Jesus says it all, it all points to me. And then you have the external test. You have the archaeology, right? The, this idea of, of, of archaeological study. You, you, you know that the archaeology is, is actually there. That not only is there more evidence to the existence of Christ than Caesar, Nero, Aristotle, Plato, and many other historical figures, time and time again, archaeology has confirmed that the, the writers of the biblical text knew exactly what they were talking about. And it's fascinating. They knew exactly what they were talking about. Instead, notice that the authors of Scripture, they never start out with things like, in a land far, far away. They, they, they never, uh, you know, start out like somewhere in outer space. They, they, they never start out with like this, this hypothetical place. Instead, they give you a documented time. They give you an exact place. They, they give you historical documentation of other historical figures. In other words, Isaiah, Isaiah 6 says, in the year that King Uzziah died. You can go in historical accounts and understand what year that was because it's not just documented in religious history. It's documented in history as a whole. Luke says it, there's a census in the year of Caesar Augustus, right? The, 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 the whole Roman world would be under this census. And you can go back and you can trace historical documentation. And you can see the census that took place in that specific date and time. And then you begin to read things like what John says. I love that we're reading through the book of John. I want to say congratulations to those of you that are following along in your Bible reading plan. Amen, somebody. Right? You should be through the first four books of John already in just one week. And I think that's awesome. And for those of you that are behind or you missed a day or two, that's okay. Don't beat yourself up. Let's just keep reading. Okay, let's just keep engaging. Let's just keep reading together. 31 days in the book of John. John says something fascinating. Now there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, which is surrounded by five colored col covered colonnades, to which you're like, whoo, that's a lot of detail. What's going on? And for a long time, they had no understanding. Scholars had no understanding where that was, no evidence for what that would look like until the 20th century, the, the, you know, that, that suddenly in the 19, or throughout the whole 20th century, they didn't know where it was, but in the 1930s, okay, there was this pool that was uncovered by archaeologists that, that gave clarity into exactly what they were talking about. It would be like the same for us, right? You're just kind of like, you know, uh, in, in the city of L.A., you know, like, like right near the, the 405 in Los Sinega, right? Like, you know, there, there's a small shop with a large donut on top. You know what I'm saying? Like, also known as Randy's. You know what I'm saying? Like, you, you would know, right? Like, you'd be able to go and you'd be able to trace that, right? But they, they traced it all the way to this. We're excavated right there, these these colonnades and these covered porches and, and where this would have happened, this, this amazing miracle that, that John talks about where, where Jesus did some life-changing things, that these findings, they don't point to the fact that, that the Bible is necessarily true. These findings just continue to endorse the biblical narrative that we find in Scripture of God's Word and what He did and God's encouragement to us. And then, and then you have the cultural test, which brings it to us personally. You have this understanding of this, this cultural test that is so incredibly important for us to know and to understand. Because many of us get to the point and we say, well, what about all the stuff that I don't agree with? What about all the stuff that I find offensive? What about all the stuff that's like, you know, I'm just not sure. You know, like, like people read things in the Bible and they struggle with it because they think, you know, it's primitive or that we, we, we've advanced way beyond that. You know what I mean? Like no, nobody lives like that anymore. But let's just think about this for a second. Just because we read things that are hard to deal with in Scripture, that doesn't mean that we just get to throw it out or avoid it. Just because there's things that kind of rub us and shake us a little bit and actually challenge us doesn't mean that we just toss it out. In other words, what I'm trying to get at is could it be, though, that, that maybe the things that, 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 that rub us the wrong way enough are just actually some of the things that maybe that you and I have just simply misunderstood. We've misunderstood because it's so easy to read Scripture through our cultural lens. It's so easy to read Scripture just through our cultural lens, just through the way that we see it, just through the way that we want it done. 
And these misunderstandings now lead us to, to be conflicted inside, that, that we read certain things, whether it be about these slavery accounts or a certain way to live life, and we're just like, I don't know. that. I mean, I can't believe that the Bible would condone that. I would say, you know what, take patience and sit in it further. Because I think you would find that some of the things that you find offensive, the Bible is actually subverting. God is actually subverting. That God is setting a new standard in place. That God is doing something new. Our culture will view, though, always will affect our view of Scripture unless we allow God to open up our heart and to open up our mind and to open up our eyes to continue to allow this word to engage us right where we're at. I love what one author says. It says, think of it this way. If the Bible is really the revelation of God, which means it's not the product of, of any culture, but it's inspired by God, wouldn't it contradict every culture at some point? And if it was from God, wouldn't it have to offend your cultural sensibilities at some point? Difficult Bible teaching should not be an argument against God. In fact, we should be encouraged at the fact that we don't find all of God's teachings easy to accept. It's just further evidence that we can trust it. That because that, that, that God's word has this ability to, to cut through, to divide soul and spirit, and to, to judge the attitudes and the thoughts of, of our heart, that, that just gives us more opportunity to say, hey, you know, I, I, can, I can trust it so I don't have to throw it out. What, what are we saying? Ultimately, it comes down to us engaging it personally to what scholars would say, establishing scripture as, as authority. And anytime you talk about scripture as authority, not just in church, but in your life, that's when things feel real awkward, real fast. Because isn't it true that you and I, we push against authority? We just want it quick, easy. We don't want to think about it too much. We just want to go with it. If it feels right, do it. Let's just go. I love Lucky Charms. I love cookies. I like Cheerios. Let's do it. Right? We just want it to be that way. But then when something rubs us the wrong way, it's hard. The reality is scripture, establishing scripture as an authority is not to, to take away your freedom. It's not to, to be something that's oppressive in your life. In fact, I would, I would argue, count, counter that argument with, with actually following God's authority which actually brings freedom to your life. God is all about your freedom. That, I mean, look at Jesus on the cross. He's all about our freedom. He wants good for us, not harm. He wants our, our freedom. So what would it look like if we just began to allow God to do an incredible work in our heart as we sat in and engaged Scripture? That we would do this on a personal level and allow God to do a work in our heart. What if we wrestled with the implications of what we're reading? What if we got a little bit more patient in what's happening in our life? I, I love this, this quote by Timothy Keller. He says, if you don't trust the Bible enough to let it challenge or correct your thinking, how could you ever have a personal relationship with God? Any truly personal relationship, the other person has to be able to contradict you. All the married people said, amen, somebody, <laughs> right? Like, you know, you know, right? Like, that's a true relationship. You and I, we know this to be true about our relationship. It's the same with our relationship with God. So again, what Timothy says from the New Living Translation, I want to leave you with this as our band comes out to worship God with us today. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our life. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. And God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Here's what I'm saying. God has good for your life. God wants to do good in and through your life. And you and I, if we're honest, we know we've got a lot of stuff in our life that needs to change. What if we opened ourselves to God and allow his word to do its work in us and to begin that change that's necessary to free us from the things that continue to hold us back so that you and I can continue to live in to all that God has created us to be. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you care for us. Thank you for your word. I thank you that your word is true. God, I thank you that we can stand upon your word. God, I thank you, Lord God, that the evidence, Lord God, points to you and to your goodness and to your grace and to your mercy. So, Father, as we continue to worship you, as we continue to celebrate you, God, I pray that we would not be afraid of your scriptures, God. Lord, that we would not ignore your word for our life, God. But, Lord, that we would actively engage, Lord, that we become involved, Jesus, and we would allow your word to shape our thoughts, to shape our mind as we become more like you've created us to be. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name.